Today's webinar, Real Life in the Classroom, Making Language Learning Meaningful. This is a little bit related to the one I did um, a couple of weeks ago. That previous one was about global skills and preparing our students with the global skills to take from the classroom into real life. But today we're going the other way around and we're looking at bringing learners real lives back into the classroom. Real life in the classroom, making language learning meaningful. So this is what we're gonna go through today. Let's get started. First of all, we're going to explore the role of learners' life experiences in the classroom. Then we'll consider what makes language learning meaningful. And then finally, this is the practical bit, we'll discuss points to remember and look at some classroom activities. And there'll be a mix of things in there. There'll be activities that you can take away and do with your class in the next lesson, or things you might want to think about and ponder all over, and maybe include in the future. So let's get started with your first question. Could I ask you to complete this sentence for me? It is important to incorporate learners' real lives in your lessons because da -da 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 -da. what do you think? You can write a couple of words, you can write a whole sentence. <clears throat> it will motivate them, Daphne, exactly. It gives them ownership of the lesson. Yeah, I like that, Michael. Excellent. Yeah, that's really interesting. Makes them active participants. Yes, motivates them. Engaging, memorable. Oh, there's so many answers that catches their attention. Psychology. Uh, they need English every day, meaningful, helps them think, helps them make connections. I like that. We'll be touching upon something like that later. Relate, talk, talk to vocab and grammar to their lives. Yes, thanks, Dominic. That's great. Stimulate the brain, Samira. Yes, excellent. Increase. Fantastic. Loads of lovely answers. Great. So let's go on and look at that first section and explore that role of learners' life experiences in the classroom and why it's important. <clears throat> so here... We've got a diagram and an infographic on the classroom and real life. So the classroom, we've got the formal instruction and inputs there, the L2 language skills and the global skills. And we've got the output. So the L2 language skills, the global skills and all those real life experiences. In the real life section, we've got using those L2 language skills and global skills and having general life experiences. And that's anything, the exciting things in life and the boring things in life, just everything in life. And right in the middle there, we've got the learner in the classroom and the real life together. And then we've got the arrows, which shows that there's an, an interesting bond between the classroom and real life. It's not, it's not a linear, static process. It's in a constant flow. It's a truly symbiotic relationship. Each one benefits and improves the other. And also there's a lot of overlap, isn't there? Because real life can afford us some amazing learning opportunities. Our students can acquire language within their non-classroom life, so to speak. And similarly, isn't the classroom part of your students' real life? I think so. So for me, there's a very natural bond and overlap there. They're two sides of the same coin in many ways. I'm just going to quickly mention global skills to you. As I've mentioned that there in the diagram, I just want to explain. It's very, very simple. It's these skills that bring together language and life because we don't talk to use words. We use language to talk about something. So four main areas. We've got thinking. So we're well aware of those as teachers, creative thinking skills and critical thinking skills. Working. So skills that are useful in the professional environment, collaboration, organisation, time management, social skills citizenship, cultural awareness, social responsibility, and learning, digital skills, numeracy, note-taking. And you'll note in this diagram, diagram that they all overlap a little bit. So all those skills can transfer within themselves. They transfer beautifully between the classroom and the real life. They're all life-enhancing and empowering, and all there alongside language knowledge. So this is quite simply what global skills are. I'll show you an example of language skills and global skills and bringing the real life into the classroom with this really simple speaking activity. And this will be, I'm quite confident, in your course book, if you have a lower level course book, there will be an introductions lesson. Why? Because it's important. Introducing yourself is the starting point for all interaction after all. So it's that fantastic global skill, the social skill of networking. Or the work skill, because you have to introduce yourself to people at work. It can transfer to different areas. 
And this is a perfect example of a really easy way to bring your students real life into the classroom. What's your name? The answer will be completely real life. Let's move on to our second section then. Consider what makes language learning meaningful. So before we do that, it's time for another little question for you. There are three questions here, but you only have to choose one. If you want to choose number one, what is your favorite English word? Type it in. If you want to choose number two, what is one thing that makes you happy? Type it in. That can be silly or serious, whatever you want. And number three, what does the word emergent mean? <clears throat> Philip, that's a good, that's a good word. Traveling opportunity health books a book with a cup of coffee oh i like that yes serendipity that's a lovely word. that's one of my favorites supercalifragilisticexpialidocious i think is going up there and that was very very well typed i think that's that's some fast fingers. playing with my cat ah uh, same here has anyone answered number three yet i'm not sure ah yes number three teodora something new something developing great thank you lovely thank you so much for answering that so this is a, an example of a real life activity because also it's an example of a meaningful activity. All of these questions are meaningful. One and two are your personal, emotional, authentic answers based on your real L1 life. And number three, it's slightly different type of meaning and a bit of a knowledge test. Um, so learning skills there, a global skill in use. So I asked you at the beginning about why is it important to include real life experience? And here are some reasons here. Some of these we've already picked up on in the chat box. So it activates target language and global skills. It prompts emergent language. We'll look at that a bit later. And we've just had a slight definition there from Theodora. Thank you. Um, it encourages authentic interaction and communication. When I asked you to choose one of those three questions and give me your answer a moment ago, that was a genuine, honest answer from me when you tell me all the things that make you happy or your favorite English words. Um, it allows for personalization. It respects the student as a person. So we remember that this is a human being. It celebrates achievements and anecdotes, all the positives that your student has in their lives. And it provides support for any problems and challenges. This one, last but not least, because it's, I think it's really important to always remember our role, our pastoral role as teachers and our our need to listen to our students in their lives. I had one student once and we were doing daily routines. She was describing her daily routine and she was a student here in the UK staying with a host family. And it became apparent that there was no interaction with the host family. All of her time at home was in her bedroom and the bathroom. She had all her meals in the bedroom. There was no chat at all with the host family. So because she was able to have that space and that confidence to explain that situation, it then meant we can move her to a great host family and things improve. Just a reminder to always make sure we give a little bit of space and time for real life experiences, because sometimes it can make a real, real difference for someone. And all of these points, in short, it just makes language learning meaningful. Time for another question for you. Can you give me a definition of the word meaningful? What does it mean to you? That it makes sense, that it's important, it's relatable, it matters, yes, it's absolutely personalized, it's important, it's useful, vital, applies to real life. Wonderful, I love all of these answers. It has significance to me, yes, exactly. It's got to be a personal aspect, hasn't there? Great, I love all these answers, they're fantastic. I think you're doing almost as good a job as the dictionary here with your definitions, they're great. So this is from um, macmillandictionaries.com, the three meanings of meaningful. So number one, with a clear meaning. And we know all about that as teachers, right? Aim and purpose of a lesson. And you've, you've just, I'm just watching again, relevant, constructive, vital, important. All these words are coming up perfectly in the chat box. We know what that is to have a clear meaning. Number two, serious, useful, important. Yep, absolutely. Number three, expressing a clear feeling or thought without words. And I love this one as well, because there is, and it's come up a couple of times in the chat box, there is that aspect of that's got to be something personal and emotional. Um, there's something about 
that eternal quality of something that makes it meaningful. Thank you. These are great, great definitions coming through. Let's move on to our, our main section then. So discussing points to remember and looking at classroom activities. And if you've come to one of my webinars before, you know that I love acronyms. And as we're talking about lessons today, bringing the real life into the classroom, into the lesson, we're going to use the word lesson. And our first section then is lesson plan. Time for another question. Two questions, in fact. So number one, do you always plan your lessons? Yes, no, depends. Number two, do you always follow your lesson plans? Yes, no, depends. And I should say by lesson plan, whatever that means to you, it might be a few notes, it might be a huge, massive Celta Delta level plan of each individual activity, it might be visualizing the class, whatever it, that means to you. So I've got lots of yeses for number one. And I think there's a balance of depends and yes for number two because we want to be a little bit flexible, don't we? And if something comes up in class, it's nice to address that and include it. So that's lovely. It depends, not always. Okay, that's interesting, lovely. I'm a massive fan of planning before, for sure. And I'm also a massive fan of then following your lesson plan a little bit, but looking and see where the students take you. I wanted to show you an extreme version of that though, a difference between the planned version and the Un un unplugged, unplanned version or dogma. So for a planned lesson, we're looking at that one first. Is there going to be a lesson plan? Yes, obviously. Materials? Yes, we're going to be following the course book, supplementary materials or materials that you've written yourself. The student's role in that class is going to be a participant and the syllabus will be generated from the course book, from the teacher or maybe for, by the institution where you work. It's a linear syllabus, so there's going to be a process to it uh, and it's a priori syllabus it's decided before the course starts in terms of language we've got target language and that just means the lexical sets that are written there um, in your in the chapters of your course book if you look at the contents chapter there'll be a list of the lexis there that you're going to cover and a list of the grammar points that's your target language and the focus will be on form meaning and use is it communicative? Yes, probably, because communicative language teaching is pretty much prevalent, I'd say, today and in most of our teaching contexts. And the skills used, we're going to have a balance of skills, language skills and global skills. So let's contrast that then with no planning. So I think most of you said in answer to the first question, yes, you do plan your lessons. So an unplugged, a dogma approach would be no planning at all. No lesson plan. You might in your head have just a first initiation, a stimulus to give to the students, and then they would respond and the students take the lesson. It goes where they want to take the lesson, what they want to talk about. So the materials, therefore, there are none or very minimal, just that first question. The students' role well, is, is everything. They are the learning resource there. So this is the ultimate way to bring a student's real life into the classroom. It's all about them. So the syllabus, in this case, it's going to be different. It's going to be student generated, which means it's organic. There's no process or staging to it. And it's an a posteriori syllabus because we won't know what the content is until after the lesson. So it's done afterwards. The language will be emergent. It's not target. It'll be whatever emerges. And the focus of the language will be more on meaning and use, not so much on form or function. Communicative, yes, yes, with two exclamation marks because it's so communicative. This is what it is all about. It's very, very conversation driven, priority and fluency, which then means for skills, it's primarily about speaking. The interaction is spontaneous, it's unscripted. Lovely, that sounds great, doesn't it? But there is an absence of literacy and other skills. There's not probably enough balance there. And certainly in terms of an unplugged lesson, I'd urge you to consider what about your students? Does it meet their needs? And I mean all of your students. If you've got a large class size, how is that going to work? It may not meet the needs of the institution. If students are paid for three-week IELTS course, it's not useful to spend 60 minutes on an unplugged lesson. Teachers as well, in, in terms of your energy, how do you feel about doing one? It might be, oh, are you confident enough to deal with all this spontaneous emergent language? 
to do all the classroom management and multitask that with your language knowledge, which will need to be very broad and very deep. So it's a, it's a fantastic development tool, but it's maybe not sustainable over a long course. For me, a course book being supplemented and tailored to your students is absolutely the way to go. So, and also for me, I think we can have our students as the center point of our lesson, but within the framework of a well thought out plan lesson and a syllabus. And you can adapt it and not necessarily always follow the lesson plan exactly. Thinking of the lesson plans, let's look now um, at stages within a lesson. Five simple stages here, and I'd like to draw your attention to the red ones. Don't forget these, the pre-lesson and the post-lesson. So pre-lesson, here's your lesson planning. That's where the aim and the purpose, remember that definition from the Meaningful Dictionary Extract? It's the aim and purpose what you're doing, why you're doing it. Then we've got the beginning of the lesson. That might be the warmer you've chosen. Um, something to introduce the topic or activate students' existing knowledge. We'll look at that point again in a moment. Uh, during, so these are all the opportunities. Remember that word. These are all the opportunities you can find in your materials to allow for personalization as you go through the lesson. And then concluding, so at the end of your lesson, that's your chance to conclude and bring together the whole lesson, maybe with a speaking activity at the end, something to bring everything together, consolidate that language and relate it to your students' lives in some way. And then post lesson, could you give them a task for your students to do related to their real life that they then bring back into the next lesson? We'll go through each of these stages of the webinar, but let's look at the next letter now. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's E for emergent language. So target language, as we just spoke about um, in that contrast between planned and unplugged, target language is what the teacher wants students to say. It's those things that are there in your course book in the contents page. Predetermined language presented in a teacher's input. It might also be from a needs analysis you've done with your class or something like that. Emergent language, in contrast, is what the students want to, want to say. So it could be that they made a slight mistake and they've got it wrong, or it could be that they need the word, they know the meaning, they understand the concept, but they just don't have the English word for it. Either of those options, but it's spontaneous language and it's in a learner's output. And there's a big heart there because I love emergent language. It's a great way to, for your students to practice to play with language and explore language a bit. So for me, it's always a positive. There are two examples of emergent language here. So we've got, I go swimming yesterday. And what is the name for the walking elevator in a shopping mall? Looking at the first one, is it correct or incorrect? Incorrect. Yep, I think most people are saying incorrect and it could be, it could be that yesterday, the time word, that's incorrect. Or it could be that the past, the tense is wrong. And we need to pop that back into, I went swimming yesterday. But there's something wrong there, definitely. What about the second one? What is the name for the walking elevator in a shopping mall? Positive or negative sentence, correct or incorrect or something else? We've got incorrect. Uh, Diana has said escalator. Mm -hmm, exactly. And that's a perfect example of this student Oh, understands the concept, has seen the object, knows how it works, knows what it's for, but just doesn't quite have the correct word for it. So that's a, a positive example of emergent language coming out. So when we've got all these fantastic examples and these affordances, what are we going to do with all of this emergent language? And I think that's probably how to deal with emergent language and error correction. <clears throat> that is a whole other webinar in itself so today I'm just going to show you a simple process that you can follow and you can tailor it to meet your needs so starting on the left we need to acknowledge it first of all so that may be verbal just that you've heard it it may be writing it on the board screen I saw somebody note earlier that they keep a space on the board to write emergent language I do that too that's a super super easy way to do it um, taking a note for later feedback, whatever works for you. And also, it's just always important to be actively listening to our students to show that we respect them, we listen to them, we're paying attention. So we've acknowledged it. And then if it's a positive, good example of language use, then we can incorporate it into the lesson. 
And that could be by including it in a feedback session at the end, or you add it to your class lexicon. You might have a collection of cards with new language on them, for example. You may have a shared online document where students or your class has their, their Lexis there for new, new language. Any of these techniques are just a great way of, of a sort of future reference for your students and great for revising and everything. So I'd recommend either of those ways. If you've acknowledged the emergent language and it's not positive and it's negative, doesn't matter, no worries. We've just got that slight little detour there before we incorporate the language. So we want to correct it in whatever way is suitable at that time and whatever way works for you. The formulation, elicit it, clarify it, repeat it, whatever works for you and your students, but whatever way you do, do make sure you get that uptake and you get your student to produce that correct language and to maybe produce that correct language one, two, three times, maybe get them to repeat it. So you've got a, a good uptake there and then you can move to that incorporation stage. Let's move on to the next letter, which we've kind of spoken about before, said about um, creating interest earlier came up in the chat box. So let's do an example of activating schema or schemata now, and then we'll look at what it actually is. So can I ask you to look at this photo and tell me what is in it? <clears throat> Wellington Manor, boots for Mariam. Okay, so boots. And what what do you do with boots? What are they for? They're for walking. Okay, so does that mean I wear boots on my feet? Yep, can I wear boots on my hands? No, I can't wear boots on my hands. Okay, and when would I wear these boots? Why would I wear these boots on my feet, not on my hands? For rainy seasons, okay. So I think I mentioned I'm based in the UK, I'm in England. So would these Wellington boots be a good idea for me? Yes, yes. Why would it be a good idea for me in England? It's a must in the UK. It's true, Daphne. It is. Not. It rains a lot. Yeah, brilliant. Exactly. Thank you so much for participating in that and for your super fast, brilliant answers. Yeah, so this is this is activating our schemata. So all you've done now is just use your internal, automatic, subconscious even, frame of reference for the world. You've used all your lived experiences of real life to make sense of this new input. You know that the weather's not great in England, so you know it's probably going to rain. You know that you don't put boots on your hands, they go on your feet. It's all these things that help us make sense of new input. And you've also used your global skills, your thinking skills to think critically and creatively about this picture. And, and for me, using a picture or a headline from something in your course book or from something from your phone, from the internet, is a super simple way of activating schemata, practicing language skills and global skills before you've even, even opened the course book. Let me show you the page this comes from. So here you see it, it's a, a spread there called Language and Life, which is exactly what this webinar is all about really, isn't it? It's bringing that real life back in. So this is an article about upcycling. It's a real world topic, so it's real life. It's reusing an object in a new and different way after you can't use it for the original purpose. So as we know, these objects were into boots, and now we can see from the, the plant pots. So you could use the pictures, as I said, but you could also use the headline. So upcycling projects is, is pretty boring, really, isn't it, as a headline? So you could ask students to name a variety of upcycling projects they know, to guess what that means, to research after the lesson, to collaborate together and invent their own upcycling projects, something meaningful and real life. Another way of activating the schemata, thinking about that beginning stage of your lesson, is something like this. These are two examples from um, unit opener pages in Speak Your Mind. So that's the very first page of the unit. So it introduces the topic, it introduces some of the language that's going to come up, it activates schemata, and it gives you the warmer for your lesson. And it lets you test, teach, test, and see what language competence 
your students currently have. It's great. So we can see very simple on the left there, your name, your partner's name, your cell number, your partner's cell number. It's just letters and numbers. Very, very simple, but at starter level, A1, A2, it's essential. That's great language practice. And all the language that's being practiced is 100% authentic and real from students' real life experiences. Also then with the food, food you like, food you don't like. We've got a great picture there, a lot of stimulus there, a lot of activating of the schemata, some emergent language. I think there's a lobster there, maybe a lemon, words which don't normally often come up in course books. So you could utilize that or students just write the food they like, food they don't like. Again, real life, meaningful, complete personalization. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I should say that schemata is not a new concept. It's nearly 100 years old. Piaget in 1926 is, is the father of schemata, if you like. So this is a, a long standing, excellent concept to follow. So the benefits are it helps transition students from that pre lesson life to the lesson life, whatever they were doing before, however busy their commute was, however good or bad their day was, they're now in your lesson. <clears throat> It helps to orientate students to the lesson content, as we've just shown with those um, unit opener pages. It passively and actively introduces language. It replicates real life in L1 because we use schemata in our L1 life as well. It allows teachers to gauge knowledge, competence, and the mood of the class. So you've got a little bit of information already right at the start of your lesson. And it facilitates communication and social skills those global skills, those life skills that we want our students to develop. Let's look at the next letter and it's S for speaking. And speaking for me is a super way to bring real life into the classroom. I should say that that's absolutely alongside a balance of the other language skills and systems though. It's not a, a full on extreme dogma approach. Um, I think I like the speaking because it's just, it's spontaneity. It operates in real time and it's just like any authentic conversation in real life, isn't it? It replicates real life easily. So let's look at some examples of speaking. <clears throat> got two speaking tasks here. On the left, we've got TV show viewing. And on the right, we've got housing problems in your area. So both of these topics bring real life issues into the classroom and they're authentic. Both include global skills. We've got the social skills of communication and for the housing problem, we've got social issues. We've got thinking skills and critical thinking too. We've got great language work and, some, and probably some really good emergent language is gonna arise. You might need to inject new language into the lesson. So these activities are placed at the end of a lesson. So thinking back to those five stages of the lesson, this would be number four, the concluding part. But they're quite meaty as tasks. So I think you could probably expand them into a whole lesson if you wanted to. There's lots of possibility there, lots of opportunity. It could become a class mingle. It could become a find someone who activity, a questionnaire, a discussion on advantages and disadvantages of streaming shows, whatever it could be. We've just spoken about schemata. So I wonder if I asked you for the TV show example, could you give me some examples of how you might activate schemata for using that task? What do you think? A group discussion? Yeah, that would be nice. Play some tunes of famous TV shows, and I guess which is that's interesting. I like that. And it's a different medium, which always always works and is and is a good thing. Ranking it, which is your favorite, your favorite TV program, interviews. Lovely, yeah, I love these ideas. These are great. Yeah, I think um, the question we had about playing uh, TV theme tunes, I think I'd probably start with a tiny clip or maybe a logo of a TV show. So this is one that, that I really like. I don't like reality TV shows at all, but I love this for, for some reason. Gogglebox, which, if it may or may not be in your country. I think it's in about 15 different countries around the world now, but it's very simply, um, we the viewer are watching people watching TV with their family and their friends and their reactions to it. And there's a massive cross section of people. So there's people in different parts of the country, different ages, nationalities, different beliefs. It's just a very authentic, honest, 
person or a show. It's lovely. So I maybe start with a little clip of the show and let students react to that and talk about it. Another way to practice speaking is a very simple choice board. So all you have to do is complete this empty board with topic names, topics from your course book, topics that you know your, in, your students are interested in, topics from real life, put them in there. What would be great if you could leave some of these boxes empty and then students suggest their own examples. And then you've got the act of choosing offers even more personalization and activating their real life preferences. And we're using the global skills of communication and collaboration lovely that's great and you could get all those ideas written down there and then cut them up and have them as speaking cards for students to choose and talk about let's move on to our next letter and it's o for opportunity so if i asked you how can we facilitate students real life experience as a classroom resource the simple answer is to carve out as many opportunities as possible for it in your lesson plan so how do we do this let me show you some of activities, and I'm sure that many of these will be in your course book. And you tell me, here they are, the so 12 activities. Tell me if you can find four activities that will help you incorporate real life into your lesson. I'll give you a minute to read and think and then type your numbers in. Number six, free speaking. Three, four, five. Ten for ten, twelve, nine. Find someone who I love. Find someone who. One, three, five, six, five, ten, one. Two. Lots of numbers. I'm trying to see if any numbers have been left out, and I don't think so so far. All of them. Ah, Patricia. Yes. For me, the answer here is most activities can incorporate real life experiences. It's just how we spin it and use it in our classroom. So answering an open ended question, if that question is a question about your students real lives. Yes, that works, doesn't it? If we're asking students to review a product that they've purchased in that L1 life and they're practicing their English using it, that works, doesn't it? Find someone who's come up and a number of times that's always really popular and that's a fantastic easy way to really naturally find out more about your students, get them talking about their real life and use their language skills. Even completing a gap fill or a sentence prompt can still be about real life. If it's um, say an interview or about between your two students and that's gapped, if students are just completing a sentence asking about a part of their life, that's great. And it could be that you've done an interview and students have written a uh, sort of a description about um, their partner's life. And then the student gaps certain words, certain bits of information, and then that's worked together again to build that up. There's so many ways of changing an activity and twisting it a little bit to bring out that real life experience. Or you can just choose an activity like this one, which is all about real life and your students will be able to talk about their professional lives with this. So here's an example um, of an, a great opportunity and it's global skills, it's work skills here. This is from a follower pro, this is a section that runs through Speak Your Mind. It focuses on different jobs and industries throughout the course. This one as you can see is an architect and an urban planner. But let me draw your attention to the questions there. In groups answer the questions one, two, three, four, five. So these questions can really easily be repeated and used for students to talk about their own jobs or jobs they want to have. They can interview classmates, they can carry out their research, homework before the next lesson into a different job they're interested in. They can add more questions. It's a really easy way to bring real life into the classroom. And here's another way, Lexis. So the lexical set here is activities. So there's eight items here only, and we know that's a good amount because six to eight is what research tends to say is the optimum amount to present to our students. And also there's only so much room on the page. So I wrote this and I know when I was writing, it was really hard to choose which eight went there. And a lot of ideas went into the teacher's book so teachers can access them that way as well. So because there are only eight here, can you have a think now and tell me another two activities which you could teach your students to go alongside this let's call set. What would be relevant for that? So 
Skateboarding, yeah, lovely. Hobbies, which hobbies? Acting, skiing, swimming, we've got there, yeah. Cycling, painting, yeah, all, all sorts of things. Sketching, Tai Chi, photography, snorkeling, lots of different variety. Great. So an easy way to personalise for your students. You can see the box in, in the bottom left there. Make it yours to make it personal for your students. Let's move on to our final section then, noticing. So we've looked at opportunities in the class, but can you specifically and deliberately encourage your students to get their magnifying glasses and encourage them to notice English in their real life outside the classroom? So role models are a great, great way, in my opinion, to get students thinking about real life into the classroom, real people. And here's an example of a role model, Leela Downs, a very successful musician and actress and social activist. I want to show you this uh, study but into English language role models. This is a huge study. It's really interesting it's a, to assess the influence of role models on, on learning. So nearly 9,000 students, participants were in this study. 68% of them did have a role model, which is really high, I think. Great statistics here. So the role models were 64.2% native speaker, 35.8% non-native speaker, 37.8% known. So that's teachers, professors, grandmothers. So quite a high percentage, I think, for people we personally know. 55% for famous people. And we've got the two most famous ones um, from the study, Barack Obama and Emma Watson. And through all of this, uh, there are four key role model dimensions. Overall command of English, paralinguistic features, personal attributes, accent variety of English. So could you ask your students who their English language role models are? Because probably two thirds of your students do have a role model. So find out a bit more. What is it that they admire about them? Bring that back into class. Have a discussion on that. Also, loads of other ways to notice English out there. If you're in the English, an English language speaking environment, then you can get students to take photographs of funny bits of language, like the Mind the Gap um, from the underground, or like the little rabbit, just get them to listen out and eavesdrop on conversations and see if they pick up anything interesting. Or they could choose a book and do some extensive reading. That's always, always a great, great study technique that I'm a fan of, but also a great way to bring real life into the lesson. TED Talks or Netflix, could they watch a show or watch a speech with subtitles? pick up some new language, tell us about it in the next lesson, why they liked it, why they didn't. And also maybe you could set up an Instagram account or a WhatsApp and share what's going on in students' real life before their next lesson. And this brings me to the end then. So I'd just like to recap what we've covered in this webinar. We've explored the role of learners' life experience in the classroom, that diagram between real life and the classroom, which was very much interconnected. And we've considered what makes language learning meaningful. You've given me brilliant definitions, maybe better than Macmillan Dictionary, I don't know. Number three, we've discussed points to remember and looked at classroom activities using lesson as an acronym. So lesson was lesson plan, E was emergent language. What was S? Can you remember? Two S's, so you can take your pick. Schemata and speaking, what was O? Opportunity and N, just done that one. Noticing, lovely, thank you so much. And I could quickly ask you if you wanted to, in your next lesson, could you now find opportunities for real life and include them? Could you tell a colleague and or tag me, how did it go? And can you share your ideas online with the hashtag there? And I will now stop sharing the screen. There we are, and hand you back over. But thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everyone, for your brilliant participation. Fantastic ideas throughout. But very lucky students out there. Amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Rona. It has been such an amazing webinar. You can see all the comments over here. How participants, you know, were uh, answering, and everything was so so amazing. I was just, you know, really, really attentive when you were talking about TV shows and using that uh, topics because 
when I was a teacher, I used to use that to, you know, yeah. connect, as you were saying, with, with yeah. real. It's just Definitely. nice and amazing. So um, I just find a couple of questions here mm -hmm. in the Q&A. Let me see the very first one. Well, the very first one is actually not a question, but she wants, uh, no, he wants to thank you for the wonderful webinars. And oh, uh, thank you. this teacher hopes that we want, someday can uh, offer TESOL and TEFL. Okay. One, one question that is actually for you is from Amir. I hope I'm, I'm saying the, the name appropriately. How can we create tasks as meaningful as possible for adult learners in EFL context who are motivated to learn the language, but do not get a chance to use it outside the class? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's the lack of outside the class is really, really difficult, isn't it? So, yeah, I think there's always probably maybe a sneaky way you can practice it outside the class, maybe that WhatsApp group or something like that, even if students are just thinking about it in two days after lesson, just something to say hello and connect that way. But in class, I think that the key thing always is your students' needs, what's relevant, what's interesting, and it's starting with them and finding out what it is they want from the course. Maybe looking at your course book and choosing topics together, different areas, but always just keeping that communication and checking that every lesson is as much as you can prepare, it, it's meaningful and it's relevant. And then lots of personal questions, lots of open-ended questions to keep people thinking and talking and communicating. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful ideas. And you also mentioned them actually some right in, in, in webinar. Um, something else that somebody else here was ask, asking, Karen Paraco, eh, any suggestions or tips for one-on-one -on -one classes? Oh, well, this is somewhere where you could perhaps use an unplugged approach. I know in the one I've used, it tends to be with one or two students. So then you're completely <laughs> using everything from them as, as the learner, uh, as the resource. So I think, and again, it's that needs analysis in your first lesson. You want to work out what their goals are, what their aims are, and you want to sort of co-create that syllabus, really. And it can be a flexible, organic syllabus along the way, but if they need to work on their presentation skills, or if they need to be good at writing reports or they're worried about pronunciation, whatever the issue is, that's key. Um, making sure it's super relevant and always tailored. Exactly. And the very last one, uh, Rona, how can I correct students' mistakes in the lesson? Immediate correction or delayed? What's your suggestion? Oh, well. <laughs> What do you want to choose? Yeah, that is a whole webinar. I think I, I pick and change always. Um, traditionally, we say, don't we, if it's fluency, you don't want to interrupt them. You're just going to take a note and you're going to deal with it later so that your student is um, practicing their fluency, purely that. If it's accuracy and it's getting vowel sounds or individual words, then yes, I would always correct on the spot. I, I do think sometimes it's the case for doing it within fluency if someone is mispronouncing a word and it's there, or there's a fossilized error that's coming up, then I'm quite a fan of saying it and grabbing it when it's there. But it's very, it's difficult for me to answer because it's very much a, an individual preference and, and what works for you and your students, really. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that's the point, what works better. Um, well, there are a couple of more questions, yeah. I think. I don't know, let's see if we have time. How could we make more interactive classes while they're not interested in learning? As you're saying, another webinar's probably right. How to make it more interactive? Yes. Um, in that case, well, I guess it's look at your syllabus and seeing if you've got lots of reading, if you've got lots of writing, if you've got those more um, passive skills, then maybe, um, well, not that writing's passive, but if you've got the less, uh, less spoken element in there, it's probably decreasing those a bit and increasing the speaking and the communicative element and have listening, but have it more as, part of the speaking. So you're listening through pair work. Um, also a good tip would be just thinking about your change of pace. So maybe every seven, eight, 10 minutes, depending on the length of your lesson, that you're going to ask a completely different question. What's your favorite English word? What's it? And do something to make them just stop, think, and just change their energy for a second. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you, thank you, Rona, for your answers, for oh. your for all this beautiful webinar very very interactive um 
uh, throughout you know the, 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 the session. And as you were listening and observing the examples that Rona was uh, delivering through the session, they were taken from this uh, course book, right? That she is also uh, part of the author uh, team. So teachers, if you are interested in joining us, thank you very much, Rona. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.